Hey everybody, welcome back to another Foundations in Faith, continuing to walk through those foundational beliefs of Christianity, of Lutheranism, through the Book of Concord, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Large and Small Catechism, and the Scriptures, really diving into what it is we believe as Christians and as Lutherans. Last week we talked about baptism, kind of an introduction to baptism, um, outlining kind of a pretty big overview of what that is, what the sacraments are, uh, as we'll be talking about the Lord's Supper coming up here soon as well. This week, I want to dive a little bit deeper into baptism and uh, get into the scriptures. That's going to be the main focus of today, getting into the scriptures. What do they have to say about baptism? And where do we see the benefits of baptism within scripture? Um, along with that, I do need to say that this is by no means an exhaustive um, study on baptism. This, this is not everything there is to say on baptism. That would take a very, very long time to do. Um, but this is just kind of, a, again, a foundational overview, but getting into the scriptures as opposed to um, the Book of Concord, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, and all of those good things. So um, to start off with, as we do talk about the benefits of baptism, the first one that I want to bring up and point out is that in baptism, we actually receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is promised to us within baptism. And we see this all over, especially the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the story of the early church after the ascension of Jesus Christ, um, and how they got started, how they expanded, how this church grew um, in the way that it did to become this global movement. Uh, the book of Acts talks a lot about baptism. We see baptism happening quite a bit there. Uh, so if you are curious, if you want to see what this looks like, um, you can read through the book of Acts, and you can kind of walk through and see what baptism looked like then as well. Uh, I mentioned last week that it's, it's within the book of Acts that we get some of our infant baptism teachings as entire households were baptized, as entire households um, at that time especially would include small children, most likely infants as well, and they were not excluded from that baptism, but rather welcomed into it. But this morning I'm going to focus in on Acts chapter 19 um, for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 here uh, is what I'm reading from. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So Paul now is teaching in Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked, Well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. So these disciples, they, they'd heard the word, they'd heard about Jesus Christ, they believe in Jesus Christ, and yet they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't even know the Holy Spirit was a being, was something they could receive. And so Paul points this out to them and says, uh, speaking towards the baptism, what baptism did you receive? Or what, what baptism were you baptized into? They say the baptism of John. And so Paul explains John's baptism, this is verse 4, uh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus Christ. And so on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And so we see here there is an element of, yes, belief that comes before baptism. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in the word they had received from other disciples about him, and yet still hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And it's only when they are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that the Spirit actually comes on them. And then they're given the spiritual gifts. They're given um, the, the gift of prophecy and speaking in tongues here, it says. And so along with the gift of the Holy Spirit does come the spiritual gifts that we are given. And this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 uh, through 11. And here Paul is writing about those spiritual gifts. He says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit that's given to you in baptism what do those spiritual gifts look like, or what gifts does that Spirit bring? To the one there's given, through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing, by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. But... Key to all of this is what Paul has to say in the next verse, verse 11. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each just as he determines. And so it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, that one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that then gives all of these different gifts. And it's through these gifts, then, that the Holy Spirit chooses to work and operate 
within this world. Those gifts also bind us together. They bind us together as the body of Christ. They bind us together um, as the way that Christ has chosen to work in this world, that he's chosen to carry out his will within the world through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, through working through us. Um, And as he does that, he calls us to be his body, and again, binds us together, unifies us through the Spirit, which is one of the reasons that we highly encourage baptism to take place within the church. Now, I said last week, do you have to be a pastor to baptize someone? No, absolutely not. It's not the pastor, it's not the office, uh, the pastoral office that makes baptism effective. What makes baptism effective is the promise of God, the Word of God, and God's presence there, and the faith and the Holy Spirit that show up within baptism. Um, So it's not the pastor doing the baptism, and yet we encourage people to have a baptism at church because of this, because of this teaching. Um, And the truth that as you are baptized, you are baptized into the body of Christ. You are baptized into this family. You are unified with the body of believers. And that's a powerful statement, a powerful testament to have a baptism in the church, in the midst of other believers, as we welcome that baptized, baptized child or baptized person into our family. So there is a unity that comes about through baptism, through the Holy Spirit, um, that we celebrate, that we encourage within the church. The next gift I want to focus in on through baptism uh, is the forgiveness of sins. And so, again, we're going to turn to Acts. Here we're in Acts chapter 2. And this is all over through Acts again. So please, if if you want more, feel free to read through Acts and study in that way. Uh, But this is Acts chapter 2, 36 to 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Powerful statement of who Jesus is, of what he did. Um, and the power of his name, his name that we are baptized into. Then continuing on, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, to the Jews that were standing around, that were listening to the sermon. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter here is very closely linking forgiveness of sins with baptism. Very, very closely in that sentence. Also, he mentions, again, the gift of the Holy Spirit that's given there. Um, Paul speaks this way as well in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Such were some of you. Um, And here, in the verses just before, he's given a list of sins, of sinful people, of the way people were living in their sins, calling them drunken, idolaters, um, all those good things. And continues on to say, such were some of you, people in Corinth, who are baptized, who are now in the church. You were that, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So again, you were washed. You were baptized in that way. And through your washing, you were sanctified. You were made holy. Your sins were forgiven. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through that baptism. Uh, Again, from Acts chapter 22, this is verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the name of God. Um, So again, all over in Scripture, just a few passages there that highlight baptism does bring the forgiveness of sins, the washing away of sins, and justification uh, with God. As we talked about justification for a number of weeks beforehand, um, yes, through faith, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in what he's done for us, and baptism is a way that that comes to us. It's something that our faith can latch on to, our faith can turn to, and say, I'm baptized into Jesus Christ. His sacrifice was for me. I believe in that sacrifice. I believe in Jesus. Because of that, my sins have been washed away. The last one that I really want to get into, and I want to spend some time on this. How are we doing on time? Uh, nine and a half minutes. All right. Um, baptism brings about a change. Brings about a change in the person. I've said before, identity is a really big teaching for me. Who we are, who we were before Jesus Christ, who we are after faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism is one of the key ways that our identity is changed. Our identity is changed from sinful to righteous. Our identity is changed from of the world, worldly, caught up in our sins in that way, to of Christ. Now we are in his home, in his household, in his inheritance, not caught up in our sins, but rather freed from our sins. 
And so Romans really speaks this way. Um, I'm not going to dig into these verses uh, that I'm going to give you, but I encourage you to look up these verses to do a little bit of study on your own um, that speak this way, speak of new life in baptism. That would be Colossians 2.12, and you can read around there, Galatians 3.27, Titus 3, 4 through 7. Uh, Hebrews actually speaks this way as well, the author of Hebrews, as he talks about ancient Israel and the way that God brought them through the Red Sea. And the author of Hebrews there actually links baptism and the Red Sea very, very closely. It's saying they were brought through the water, they were washed in a way through the Red Sea, they were brought from death to life, from slavery to Pharaoh, slavery in Egypt, now to new life as the people of God, as the chosen people of God, as, as he led them. Um, they see the author of Hebrews links closely that walking through the Red Sea very closely with baptism, brought from death to life, brought from slavery to freedom. So I encourage you to read through Hebrews as well. But what I want to focus in on uh, most closely is Romans chapter 6. And this is a key, key passage for what it means for us to be baptized, how our identity is changed through baptism. I'm just going to pull it up here really quickly on my computer because I closed out of it. Romans chapter 6. And I just want to read through this. I want to speak about it as I read through it. What shall we say then? Paul says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Seeing that we are saved by grace through faith, not by our own works. Paul then puts this question out there. Should we go on sinning so grace may increase? This is commonly referred to as chief grace. If I keep sinning, well then God's grace is made even more powerful because he's forgiven more sins in my life. And Paul puts that out there and then he says right away, he answers his own question, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know... This is a key verse, Romans 6, 3. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So in baptism, it's, it's a very literal death that is taking place, a drowning of our sins that is taking a place. And so yes, bodily we're not put to death, and don't be afraid when you hear about baptism that someone's going to drown you. No, it's not that you're physically going to die, but spiritually, you are put to death. The old Adam, your sinful nature, is put to death. And as you come out of the water of that baptism, then you are raised to new life, to new righteousness, to now being a slave to Jesus Christ instead of a slave to sin. This is one of the reasons that I love full immersion baptism. And we don't practice it here. We do um, sprinkling baptism or kind of a pouring of the water on the head. But there's a beautiful symbolism and a beautiful uh, statement that is made in full immersion baptism. As the person is placed below the water as their sins are drowned and then brought out of the water into new life, into a baptized life. That's what Paul is speaking of here, that our sins are drowned, our old self is put to death, and Jesus raises us to new life through the power of God the Father. He goes on to say then, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, if we have died like Jesus Christ, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. One of the promises of baptism is eternal life, that we will experience a resurrection. Not a resurrection through baptism, meaning that as you come out of that water, you're given new life. Yes, you have that. Yes, that is a promise. But here he's speaking of a resurrection in times to come, at the end times. That after you die in this world, after Jesus Christ returns, you are given, you are promised eternal life. That you will be raised from the dead and live eternally with Jesus Christ. He speaks about that a little bit further in Romans 6, so we'll, we'll touch on that again as we get there. But he continues here, Romans 6, verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And again, linked very closely to baptism. Through baptism you have died. Through that death you've been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. 
Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. All of that happens through baptism. We're removed from the law and put under grace through baptism, through the forgiveness of sins that's given us in baptism, through the new life that is given to us, this resurrected life here, now, and present as the people of Christ rather than living in sin. What does that look like? As we were slaves to sin before, now we're baptized, now we are slaves to righteousness. Paul goes on to say, what then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. So first it was so that grace might increase. Now it's saying, does it even matter if we sin? It doesn't matter, we're not under the law, we're under grace. He answers that question, by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. He's saying, pick, which are you going to do? Are you going to serve sin? Are you going to serve that old master? Or are you going to serve Jesus Christ? There's only two options here. Um, and there was, uh, there's a lot of discussion about free will. What does free will look like? But St. Augustine wrote a book called On the Freedom of the Will. And he basically puts forward what Paul is saying here. He echoes scripture and says we really don't have free will in the way that we often think about it. No, our wills are bound either to sin before Jesus Christ, before saving faith, and before baptism. Um, we don't have any choice. Everything we do is sin. We talked about that a little bit when we spoke about um, the nature of sin and original sin. I think that was the second week of uh, Foundations and Faith. Now we are slaves to righteousness. Our will is bound up to serve Jesus Christ instead. And so the way we would say that is that we are freed to serve Jesus instead of uh, bound to serve sin. But we are slaves. As human beings, we are created to serve something. Are we going to serve sin or are we going to serve our Creator? Or are we going to serve Jesus Christ? Thanks be to God, he says in Romans 6:17, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And again, all of this starting out very, very uh, beginning of this chapter in verse 3 comes about through baptism. Through baptism, you have been set free from sin and now have become slaves to righteousness. And that's not an oppressive thing. Rather, that's a freeing thing. Slaves to righteousness means we're serving Christ in the way that he's called us to serve. It means we're operating and functioning as the creatures he's designed us to be, rather than in a broken relationship with the Father. We're now operating in a renewed and restored relationship with the Father. So Paul goes on in all this talk about slavery. He says, I'm using an example from everyday life because of our human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity, to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. You can't have two masters, he says. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Again, through baptism, the result is eternal life. Our identity has been changed from slaves to sin, from caught under sin and under the power of sin, to now slaves to Jesus Christ, people living in his family, people who live in that promise of forgiveness of sins, that promise of eternal life. And if you want to put just, just the greatest point on it, and this is a much loved verse, many of you probably have this re memorized um, in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Your identity as a sinful person is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God as our identity is changed through baptism to now slaves of righteousness, living in Jesus Christ, living under his rule and in his kingdom. The free gift that he gives us through that baptism is eternal life and eternal life with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So that's a, digging a little bit deeper into baptism. Again, there's so much more we could say, but we're running up towards 20 minutes here, and I don't want to go on too long. Well, we could speak about this again for ages and ages, but I do encourage you, if, if you want to engage with this um, topic and talk with me about this, I do encourage you to reach out 
Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com, S-T-P-A-U-L-B-O-C-A.com. I'd love to email back and forth with you, answer any questions, dive deeper in, uh, and see what, what questions you might have. You can also comment on the YouTube video down below here, and I'll be checking those as well to see if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, next week, we're going to dive into the Lord's Supper, so we hope to see you again.